Well, thank you so much. And great to see everybody. Uh, welcome, welcome. Um, super excited to be with y'all today. I'm going to jump in um, and we'll I'll see if it will advance. Um, so this is a slide courtesy of Dr. Prasadis. I think this is really interesting because we talk about Yersinius pestis being the black plague, but the white plague really uh, in terms of um, uh, tuberculosis has really been with us for a very long time. We see um, archaeological evidence of tuberculosis in the ruling class of England um, when they did uh, pathology work there. So it's really been uh, problematic. Um, the, the wasting disease, the consumption in La Bohème, so it really has a prominent place um, in, in arts, but also in history and changing the course of, of history. Um, and it's still with us today, unfortunately, but we're going to talk about how we can all uh, decrease the, the numbers. Um, and also, likewise, um, with HIV, right? So again, kind of a, a modern uh, day, unfortunately, plague that we're also grappling with. Um, and at one time, this was one of the, the highest cause of deaths for adults 25 to 54 years old. Now, unfortunately, as our youth, I just learned this morning, it's actually gun violence. Um, but this uh, tuberculosis and HIV uh, together certainly caused a lot of morbidity and mortality it's getting better, but um, for some context. So again, kind of uh, correlating TB and HIV similarities um, this is the TB cases reporting area. This is courtesy of Dr. Kusanas. Florida is 6%, mainly because of population size. Um, you'll see in contrast um, with, uh, and actually similarities with HIV, this slide is my own from AIDS View, uh, a wonderful resource for folks trying to find and incidents of HIV in their region. Um, and you can see kind of the similarities. Why is that? Mostly it's population driven, certainly migration uh, driven, but also infrastructure driven. Um, the United States, unfortunately, has one of the most, uh, I guess, disrupting and disorganized healthcare systems in the developing world. Uh, we're very lucky at the VA to have a kind of a systemic network of care, and certainly our health departments uh, try to create organization. But it's very hard to have a, a um, unified national screening program like many other uh, countries do. Um, so you're probably familiar with the status of HIV prevention and care continuum. I think this is a really, really wonderful uh, schematic of no wrong door approach, right? So for HIV care, we think of prevention and treatment, we think of PrEP and post-exposure prophylaxis. Now, I think similarly, and I'll challenge you today to think about tuberculosis as a proposed status neutral, right? So in ID, um, we actually see a lot of people at risk, right? So um, we, I think we're very good as clinicians of, of finding out, all right, who do we need to screen, right? Uh, who do we need to screen? So we, we all know about immunomodulators, right? TNF alpha inhibitors, uh, monoclonal antibodies, uh, working with our RIM colleagues to screen. Uh, for tuberculosis. And we all are familiar with correctional system, right? So when I was training in Connecticut, I was the pager person for all new HIV and TB cases in the entire state of Connecticut. Uh, they screened. <laughs> oh yeah, it was the sleepless nights. But we have correctional system screening um, usually at the entry of anyone coming into the correctional system. Why? Because close quarters and high risk um, and a lot of substance recovery programs, particularly for hepatitis C, but also screen for tuberculosis. Housing shelters, we know. Refugees populations, certainly high prevalence. Endemic travel, yes, I've seen this actually with people um, going on, on um, extended cruises or different uh, endemic area travel. Now, I'd like to also kind of challenge you today for PrEP. So in our PrEP populations, um, I've begun uh, screening late tuberculosis as a one time, especially if there's high risk, and we've actually had um, some positives. So that's very interesting. I think to consider, um, we've seen that in our community for Department of Health settings and also in high-risk VHA populations. Um, and military duty exposure, we've noticed that in VA, we've had um, folks come up as positive um, who've done Coast Guard work. So flying in close quarter helicopters uh, throughout the Caribbean, uh, working with uh, refugees from the Caribbean. Um, we've had some with McDill with high, de high density deployments. Um, and, and you can imagine our deployments are in high prevalence areas, right? Afghanistan, Iraq, refugees. Um, we're talking uh, breakdowns of um, health uh, systems. And so our troops are actually having high exposures as well. And when they're in close quarters or in long flights, uh, that can also be high exposure. So it's certainly in the VA um, uh, setting, um, we've had um, uh, unexpected um, positive quantities. Uh, positive tests. Um, and we're all familiar, of course, with symptomatic, right? We know this from med school, weight loss, hemoptysis, pulmonary skin findings, x-ray, certainly when the AFB sputum or cultures are 
our palette. We're going to go into that a little bit more into the subtleties. This is a slide uh, from Dr. Kasanis. Um, thankfully, we have had TB cases go down. This is intentional and a lot of hard work by a lot of people. Uh, this is not by accident. Uh, many of you probably recall uh, in the early 1990s, um, we had such a resurgence of TB, um, actually in the 70s too. Um, just, I'm not sure if y'all remember, because it's, I, uh, but it's really interesting. Um, TB was really, really low in the 70s and 80s. And unfortunately with HIV, um, some of the funding had stopped for TB because people thought it was, you know, eradicated and controlled and then it popped back up. So this is, takes a lot of sustained effort. As you know, public health is works the best when you don't see it happening. But as soon as you stop funding, when you stop services, um, it comes back. So this is certainly no accident. This is a lot of hard work. Um, so TB cases by age group, because we're uh, screening, uh, we're really getting people into care. And I think um, working to uh, working collaboratively with health departments and, and health care systems. Yes, sorry. Question, the, yes. the dip yes. in 2020 and the increase in 2021, yes. do you feel that was likely due to uh, detection or surveillance or was it shifting of resources? I so all of the above. So I think we see that our testing for tuberculosis and HIV, for that matter, um, and then likewise, as you alluded to, the positive tests that we received were all decreased in 2020. And you're right, there's an artificial bump, both in HIV diagnoses and TB uh, diagnoses in 2021, um, mainly because people weren't getting tested. The healthcare structure was shifted towards COVID diagnostics. People weren't coming into care, understandably. Uh, so yes, all of the above. I, I don't think that's a real scientific dip. It's more of a, as you said, a diagnostic uh, dip. Um, in fact, we actually got, interestingly, calls from WSF and, and a lot of media folks when they saw the HIV numbers come out and they were higher in 2021 and 2022. I was like, no, I think it's just, you know, we haven't really diagnosed them until now. Um, but certainly there's not even to say, are, are people social isolating possibly? But I, I don't think that's really it. I think it's, as you said, it's just the diagnosis people aren't getting to care uh, for sure. Any other questions on those? That's a really good question. Yeah, yes. that line, we were telling, you know, at, at least from an outpatient perspective, we were telling patients stay home, go to the clinic. Right. It was so difficult. It was, you know, I was shifted here from my primary care to try to, to keep the ID clinic afloat as well. Yes. Um, because it was so difficult to coordinate labs yes. for, for these people during this time. Absolutely. So obviously, just because of those, you know, logistics. Yes. We weren't getting screened. Absolutely. And and veterans that are saying weren't wanting to come in. And we actually were having drive-by labs in some of the C box, outdoor lab draws, uh, exactly for our HIV company care. And we're so appreciative, Dr. Ripardo, for stepping in. <laughs> <laughs> and that's how we developed our, you know, group goal platform. Yes. ID clinic before yes. then was yes. really face to face. Yes. Exactly. So it, it did supercharge telehealth, not only in VA, but throughout the country for sure. Um, this also, I think this is interesting. Many of us are, are familiar with this, um, but why is this um, important? Well, um, when you have patients coming from other places, high prevalence areas, um, definitely worth a screen. Um, this goes for students matriculating, your patients that you're seeing, um, even people spending a long time on military deployment or diplomatic missions. I uh, had a good friend who was deployed to Vietnam with the embassy and came back with severe tuberculosis. She was treated in country. So certainly uh, no one is immune. Um, and uh, this is, I think, important to remember uh, for screening or people spending long times on um, different sabbaticals or deployments. Um, and this is a percentage. And I think this is also important to remember. We think about TB being mainly pulmonary, but as Dr. Casanos reminds us, um, it's it can be lymphatic, it can be other. We've seen bone cases. We had um, a really kind of a sad case a few years ago uh, from India who had actually had extensive bone and joint findings with MDR TB. So that can be really, really difficult. And that's why it's so important, as you can imagine, to screen and treat for latent TB um, at high risk populations um, once it gets to the bones and joints, obviously. More, more complicated. So um, this is uh, a joint slide. This is mainly Dr. Kasanas, but I wanted to go over this. We know HIV because of the immune system, right? Specifically, the CD8, uh, CD4 and CD8 cells are very interesting in this role. And we'll get into the science in a little bit. But as you know, the quantifier and test actually looks at CD4 and CD8 cells specifically because um, they're concerned with co-infection with HIV. Um, and so um, we know about integration, we know comes with settings. Um, so uh, this is um, 
from Dr. Kasanis, I want to go over the basic um, science. So we know this, the transmission, establishment of infection, progression of the disease. But I think what many people forget is how long people have to kind of be in the same uh, situation. We've talked about that a little bit. This is wonderful, uh, Dr. Netter here, the artist Netter. Uh, really fantastic. It is droplets. Um, I still wear masks on airplanes now. <laughs> Just because, you know, you don't know, I mean, RSV, I mean, it's, it's become my new normal. Um, so uh, we're the only oddballs on the plane wearing masks. But I think it's I think it's really a good practice um, because I think at least, you know, we're all exposed and then we're all um, talk with immunocompromised patients. So I, I feel like it's good practice. But in any case, you'll see it goes to the lungs and the tonsils, lymph nodes, intestines, um, and certainly um, oh, oh, sunlight. I just want to, I'm sure you all know, do you remember the solariums? This is a fun fact. To start. Okay. And especially in the Northeast, you'd have these beautiful Victorian homes and people would go for solariums. And uh, also in China has done this too. So I, when I was touring their MDR facilities, they would actually have balconies um, and uh, they would, you know, actually use the sunlight to help disinfect and um, help people. So it's, it's actually a truth, truth in that. Um, for experience. Yes. I did my rotation in Colombia. Yes. Um, people that had MDR2B, their wards were open. Yes. Their wards were open. Yes. The light was buoyant. Yes. Absolutely. And I think Paul Farmer's um, work in, in Haiti, his tuberculosis solarum, exactly, um, because of uh, resources, the windows were exactly open and they worked with cross ventilation. Um, absolutely right. Um, and so I know many of us are familiar with this. It's always helpful, though, to document it when you're talking with folks. Sometimes we just gloss over it, but I do try to document specific things. Um, to this point, we had a really interesting case of the A. His main exposure was actually working with migrant workers. He was with the USDA and would be uh, in the fields um, working with multiple uh, uh, populations. And um, he actually had pesticide exposure. And as you know, silicosis is um, a um, risk factor as well for TB or any pulmonary irritation. Um, so I think that's also interesting to, to work on. Um, and I think Many of us are familiar with this, uh, but just anything um, that you're wondering about. So I know many of you are familiar with this, the sputum smears. Um, and I think this is this is very interesting. Um, and it is it is kind of a the red snapper, if you will, um, how this looks. Um, and we're sending these out currently, but we do have West Haven and Quest that we send these out. So um, it does come back. Um, this is really interesting from Dr. Kasanis. One good cough, it's 465 droplet nuclei, right? And usually you have to be in the room, my understanding, about eight hours continuous contact. Um, certainly, I could imagine if your immune system is not that strong, I'm sure there's some plus or minus hours on there, but um, speech even. So choirs, right? Remember the early days of COVID? People in Singapore would get COVID from choirs because people are just moving out uh, air. So um, this is severe. We know about this, so I, I won't I, I won't belabor the point. But um, basically, there's a high bacillus load. Um, I think the the takeaway here is certainly you want to do an X-ray if you're really concerned. Even with a latent TB diagnosis, sometimes you can go to CT, especially if the person has high risk of coxiomycosis or histoplasmosis or something. If they're going on immunodilator, if you're worried about that, you can you can do those as well. So you don't just have to do an X-ray and call today if you're really concerned. Um, no one will will fault you for doing a CT if you're really worried. Um, because you can have recurrence of other nodules. Um, so we don't do this much anymore. This used to be, and this used to be on boards, but um, as you know, in HIV, it has to be five millimeters. Um, and then general populations, about 15. And then everyone else, usually around 10, including healthcare workers, remembering these correctly. Um, these were obviously problematic, right? Because it was hard to get your patient to come back. I remember my residency days, we'd actually make health visits in New Hampshire <laughs> to read tuberculosis testing because it was really hard for folks to drive in. Um, so Quan Gold has really simplified. I don't think we really do this much anymore. Um, it's very problematic for multiple uh, mm -hmm. reasons, especially in our immunocompromised populations. I would not recommend this um, in your HIV care. It's really not the standard of care anymore. And in fact, I, I would really you know, quantify on gold and, and uh, T spots. But just for historical purposes, you might see this. Um, so this is, um, as you know, this might be on boards. I don't know if it is anymore, but it used to be on my boards um, and they try to trick you. But basically where they would try to trick you is IV drug use. Again, it's all a continuum, right? If someone came to me with a five, I 
certainly, I would certainly screen them, right? Uh, you're not going to write them off. Um, but these are the kind of general guidelines and the board likes to trip you up on these. But um, and I think in real life, if you have any uh, signal, I would, you know, in the United States, certainly move to a quant gold. I need drug use yes. in which category? I believe it's 10. Yeah. I believe it's 10. But this person could have HIV, right? So we're going to be screening them for HIV anyway. Exactly. Um, and people's immune systems, I mean, you never know what's going on. So, um, yes, currently there. I believe healthcare workers are 10 millimeters. Where is the 10? Where healthcare yeah, workers? healthcare workers are 10. And I think incarceration or... I think it's 10, 10 also. Yeah. Exactly. Learn, I think that middle. Yes. Highly tested. Yes. Yeah, I think I think exposure, right? Prevalence, travel is ten. Homelessness. Um, I believe it's also ten. I did a quick review before I came. I think it's for five. It's just close contacts, HIV, right, and past TB. Um, exactly. Fifteen millimeters is no medical risk factors, but you know sometimes you don't know about those until you ask. Exactly. So, <laughs> questions. Hey, boards will probably, you know. No, 50 millimeters is no risk factors as easy. And five millimeters HIV is easy, I think. Mm -hmm. Well, the trajectory to the middle. Right, great, great point. All right, so um, this is really interesting. So um, I guess the take home message is the quant gold test. I really like it. Um, it. It looks at nil, it looks like CD4, CD8. And I, I would love for y'all, next time you see a quant gold that's positive, actually look at the um, the numbers. Um, we've had some cases we've run by the Florida Department of Health uh, with Mike Ashkin, who's fabulous. He's the point person for, he's a pulmonologist. Um, he'll actually talk with us about the, the numbers themselves because they matter uh, in terms of the, the increase or the, the quanti uh, quantifiable rise in terms of likelihood of um, latent TB, but certainly not not exact by any means. That, uh, for your boards, it doesn't matter particularly. But why I'm mentioning this, um, it goes with the ESAT 10 and the CFP 10, right? Um, why is that important? Do you remember the there are only four types of non-tuberculosis that it will interfere with or cross-react? Y'all remember? Uh, M. cassaceae, uh, Miriam, uh-huh. And then um, I think it's uh, Sagari. And um, it's like flavorescens or fluorescens. It's flava meaning yellow in Latin. But there are four types of bacteria that it will interfere uh, with. And we get that question sometimes in VA is when someone's quant gold, like, do they have a fish tank? You know, <laughs> have they been, you know, in the Midwest? Uh, because sometimes they can have co antium infection. I've seen that. Um, but usually this is the real deal. Um, so that's where you will look at an X-ray or a CT scan and see what's going on. And certainly um, the sputum would show usually um, multiple species. Now, interesting, Mike Ashkin will say sometimes the um, NTM can overgrow, especially if it's M. abscessus, um, can overgrow the M. tuberculosis for whatever reason. Um, so just be aware as well, you might get a culture negative M. tuberculosis. And we actually ended up co-treating this veteran for NTM and TB and gave him a uh, steroid supplementation because we were worried of tuberculosis interference with his adrenal system because he bottomed out when we tried to treat him. So we had to retreat him with um, steroids, with uh, fluticortisone. Uh, relevant to our journal article today. Uh, anyway, so active TB, we know about this. Why is this important? Well, because it does progress, especially someone living with HIV, as we know, has a higher progression. That's why we're such sticklers, right, for the yearly quant gold testing in HIV, and that's why those are national guidelines. Um, so that's why that's important. Um, so progression to TB disease, as we know, latent tuberculosis is not infectious per se, but infection with TB, certainly substance use, homeless populations, we know that. Um, but also, you know, prednisone and tumor necrosis factor, we're seeing a lot more of folks um, on these um, immuno immunodilators. Um, I think that's super important in, in ID to understand. And also, as we do a great job asking where they've been in terms of histo, uh, coccidio, um, and, and blasto, kind of those endemic fungi. Um, I think certainly Moffitt, you know, organ transplant for sure. Silicosis, I was surprised there's a lot of um, silicosis and fibro uh, work here in Florida with the pool business. So asking about um, countertops and pool um, construction um, and mining, there's a lot of phosphate mining as well. So just occupational exposure um, is really helpful. 
Um, so one is the latent tuberculosis treatment. You know, so funny, back in my day, we would do nine months of isoniazide, hope for the best, maybe six months, I'd like nine months over six, but really we're trying to do um, compressed therapy. So especially at VA, we really try to screen our patients for a three-month INH and rifampin. Remember to add your B6 on there um, with 50 uh, milligrams a day. Um, we try rifampin. Obviously, in HIV, we have to change that around a little bit. So we end up kind of with a rifapentine INH. Um, sometimes we, we rarely change the ERT, but we have been known to if it's a prolonged active tuberculosis infection. And we work closely with the Department of Health on that, obviously. Um, and then certainly nine months. Um, I do try to for nine months for HIV positive and, and pregnancy or any immunocompromised. Um, so drug levels, this is really interesting. Um, we don't really normally get drug levels. We've done this, um, it's interesting, the Florida Department of Health will get to your levels to make sure that those are still, um, those are good. They actually will help you send for ART levels if needed on certain drugs that are known to be uh, super metabolized. As you know, we don't routinely get drug levels of the TB medicines, um, but it's always, you know, good to monitor adherence. And as we know, there's directly observed therapy, uh, therapy and there's VOT, right? Video observed therapy. So um, people take either videos of themselves taking it and dating it or basically um, having like a, a Zoom or a FaceTime or a secure um, type. Now, this is really interesting. This is from Dr. Kasanis. Um, these are the types that she has been seeing, and I think she's done some early work on genotyping. Um, I think this is really interesting in terms of what we're seeing. Why is this important? Well, certainly for contact tracing, uh, but also for resistance. Um, and there's obviously more basic science work here, but looking for resistance and genotypes and, and that kind of thing. It is obviously a slowly evolving bacteria uh, but very, very interesting. Um, so jumping here to, any questions on that before I jump in? Okay, uh, just jumping in here, um, co-infection has really become kind of more of a, an issue in the United States, specifically because people may not know they have HIV infection, um, and then they may not know they're exposed to TB, and so sometimes it can come in later stages. So that's why, obviously, as an ID doctors, we try to um, screen at HIV. Um, I think primary care, thanks to Dr. Raparo's good efforts, too, is really screening for HIV um, at least once in our veteran populations. Um, Florida, and particularly the VHA, has one of the largest older geriatric populations living with HIV, so that's also why all ages are really helpful. Um, so we know this, um, and so TB is actually an AIDS-defining condition, um, and TB is still the leading cause of death for those living with HIV, interestingly enough. Um, so those are to know. So this is what I came up with, kind of with TB, HIV, co-infection, mnemonic. Uh, G is for geography. Iris, we should talk about. Um, so immune reconstitution inflammatory syndrome. So we're going to talk about that, but anybody... From, I'm sure you're all familiar with that. Um, basically, it's when someone comes to you with new HIV infection, their chest X-ray is clear, their quant gold is negative, you put them on ART, lo and behold, they come with you, they come back two weeks and they have cough and uh, not doing well, and their X-ray has uh, infiltrates, and sure enough, their tuberculosis has become reawakened. Uh, so TB iris is a real situation. Um, and that's why we always follow up closely. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, F, so if following up uh, labs, adherence, and, and video are direct observed. Um, so treatment and tolerance and teaching. This is your gift to the patient. So you have to think about <laughs> geography, iris, follow-up, and then side effects of medication. So um, we're trying to give them the correct diagnosis. So that's why we use that mnemonic. Um, it's, it's kind of helpful um, to think about it that way. So um, geography, so just basically when you have somebody with a new diagnosis, the Philippines, I believe, is included in Asian. Um, so really Southeast Asia, um, Philippines, China has done a, a rather good job in screening. It's it's gotten its rates down quite a bit, um, but certainly um, it, it's certainly endemic in other parts. Um, and those are kind of how we are. And South America, to its credit, is doing very well, too. I think Central America, maybe in, in times of conflict, um, but otherwise, um, you saw the, the graph from previous. Um, anytime you're thinking about conflict zones or refugees is really where you want to be extra careful about screening. Um, so this is important too. So we have a lot of uncontrolled diabetes in the United States. Um, so you think about contact with tuberculosis, non-HIV immunosuppression, right, on, on cancer, et cetera, and diabetes. So 
um, certainly um, something that we, we think about infection, but also with tuberculosis because we can't fight the infection. So talked about that a little bit um, and then basically um, just trying to think outside the box, trying to get a shorter regimen when you see folks. Um, this is what I wanted to, to go over. This is actually a case we saw at the health department. A uh, 20 year old woman found to have HIV infection um, during routine immigration screen, which, which we do to get people into care. Um, and then the baseline quantiferin goal in X-ray was negative. And her CD4 count was 33. Um, and she was started, and so she actually did come in with abdominal pain, fever, and cough. And um, she was originally from Haiti, and she had an absolutely normal X-ray. We talked a little about that. But I think what we need to know is that there is actually a mortality involved. So I think, you know, checking in with patients after um, treatment is important. Um, but we also see iris in non-HIV infected patients um, as as well um, when they're um, when they have um, basically negative screening. Sometimes it doesn't come in, uh, to fruition. So what do we do with um, ART and active TB? Uh, how is it different? Uh, well, if the CD4 count is less than 50, the studies really show that you start ART as soon as possible. They did some. Uh, trials and those are those are pretty um, important, I think. Um, but certainly, um, two weeks of starting TB treatment because immune uh, immune system is so suppressed. If the CD4 count is above 50 as a general guideline, you want to wait a little bit, eight weeks of starting TB uh, treatment. Obviously, during pregnancy, you'll be talking to um, the OBGYN, but you want to um, certainly have ART. Um, but also um, working on TB, I, I would certainly stagger that just a little bit. Um, and then with TB meningitis, um, certainly ART. I have a question. Yes. All very confusing. Yes. All yes. Very so these yes. people are already on TB treatment, and yes. then you start ART. You can start within two weeks because your CD4 is low. Sure. So this is this is what happened. So the this okay. So when you think about it, someone's come to you with TB and HIV co infection, oh. right? Maybe they've been on and off ART. Maybe it's a new infection, right? New diagnosis, I should say. Um, and this is done mostly in um, the studies were done in Africa, the parts of Africa. You want to start ART. So if something coming to you with a dual diagnosis, you never let's say, let's say ART naive. Okay. You want to start your ART as soon as possible, um, and then then you also want to start your TB treatment as well within two weeks. Got it. Um, start ART first. Yes, I yes, it's a very good question. I would, I would, I would um, because you need to stabilize the immune system. Um, and because of tolerance issues also, and we do this sometimes with opportunistic infection prophylaxis, you kind of want to stagger it a little bit. So let's say someone comes with this and you obviously, let's say they didn't have TB, right? But you were worried about pneumocystis. Right. We don't do azithromycin MAC prevention anymore. Um, but if you did Bactrim and ART, you usually want to start the ART, ART first, see if they tolerate it. Add the Bactrim maybe at week, you know, week one or week two. The reason if you do everything at once, you're going to have probably GI intolerance, certainly. But if you have a rash, you don't know what that's caused by, right? So um, certainly ART together and then kind of layer on, if you will, your TB therapy would obviously be like PCP in this individual, you know, would, would be lower on the differential. Could they have it? Absolutely. But then you would layer that on. You would probably give them a toba quote and you wouldn't hit them with Bactrim at that point because you want something a little bit better tolerated. Um, but yeah, so the answer to your question, and the reason why the CD4 greater than 50 is they actually did studies on this and they saw that you could um, they wanted to start ART within eight weeks of starting TB treatment. I think that was in ART naive populations. I think in the United States, we still want to start ART, but, but technically with those studies, they showed that they would start the TB treatment first and then initiate the ART just to kind of get that. Um, I think also part of that was infection risk, right? Because once somebody's on, um, I believe it's eight weeks of TB treatment, um, they're considered non-infectious. So a lot of that was I think, um, to protect other people from getting the disease, especially in MDR therapy. But right, it's, it's yes. Is there a setting cut off? Like, yeah, the patients at the health department that are newly diagnosed, you have CD4 counts 600. Mm -hmm. I mean, in those people, do you have to worry about iris as much or? Less, less so. So the good news about CD4 counts of 600, usually the x-ray will show something. It may not, but it can. Usually the quantiferon goal will be accurate. 
um, because the Conquering Goal was designed with HIV in mind. So is your question, we've had good experience with HIV in Quant Gold. Now, if this person has very high uncontrolled viral load, right, that's another story, but certainly your Quant Gold and your X-ray should be good determinants. It's an excellent question. It's really for folks with very, very low CD4 counts. I would say less than 200. Um, if if they come to you, yes, if I may, do, if they're having symptoms, right, with TB, yes, I would definitely talk to your health department. But normally, um, you can start. I would start your TB treatment as soon as possible, and then layer on that ART treatment. Um, I think technically, people want you to start that TB treatment just because they're an immediate infection risk. Um, I think that's part of it. Um, but I, I think you could probably do it within like one or two weeks of it and do that. I think classically you start that TB treatment first. Um, if it's active, I mean, exactly. talking hemoptysis. Yes. And then yes. 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 Right. 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 Um, and with the TB meningitis, there is some saying that. Oh, it's two. Yeah. Eight, yeah. Eight, eight weeks. Yeah. Yeah, eight yeah, weeks. Like, that's very, always, like, always said a whole talk on that. Yes. And yeah. that day that Curtin gave a talk, we had some guest speakers from India. Yeah. But the, but they would debate it if that patient also had lymphoma. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Had TB mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. so she yeah. started earlier. Oh, on ART. Yeah, I mean, lymphoma over eight weeks. Yeah, could you do it at four weeks? I mean, that's also something too. Um, and right, these are these are compendiums of studies and best practices in developing countries. So uh, absolutely, those are great discussion. Any other thoughts or questions on this? This is helpful. Um, yes, yes. And also for your boards, they, they sometimes ask you by the CD4 count. In life, there's always other attenuating circumstances. Um, so what is important, obviously, uh, continue your best buddy practices with your Florida Department of Health. You really want to make sure you keep them in the loop. Um, a VA, we talk to, obviously, our infection control folks and um, that kind of thing to make sure everybody's on the same page. We give our uh, clinics a heads up if they're getting uh, imaging for terminal cleaning of imaging and that kind of thing and to protect respiratory um, radiology staff. Um, so, and also just making sure you're coordinating if you have any questions with your with your ID pharmacist, making sure that you're on board with antivirals and making sure that everything is, is looking good. Um, PPI is specifically a meprazole um, or fampin can decrease levels. So you just wanna make sure that you have those down. Um, so what what are the regimens? Not to get too much into the weeds, but we're going to be following folks pretty closely. Um, interestingly, if you're not sure if it's latent or active, sometimes you can treat them with eight weeks with a ripe therapy, rifampin, isoniz, and uh, thambital paracetamide, and consider them treated for INH, and then you can reassess with a CT scan and see if you need to continue with active TB uh, treatment. Um, remember, B6 is a part. Um, of this. Um, also, importantly, obviously, e thambazole E for I, right? You want to get them to have ocular screenings. Rifampin uh, changes the urine to be a bit orange. Um, and then um, color, colorblind testing um, with, the, with the colorblind scales is really, really important so they don't have any changes in their eyesight. Um, so this is also um, HIV-infected adults. Um, so this is alternative regimen if they have intolerance to parazetamide. Luckily, we don't see this much in the States. Um, and so I think basically the general guidelines, and this is my slide, but basically monthly AFB sputum smear and culture um, until the two sequential cultures are negative. And um, Florida Department Health is really wonderful. They will actually go to the patient or friend's house and help collect that. And we've really relied on them a lot is because our home-based primary care is really not equipped um, for AFB sputum collection. And the health department does a great job. They have their own uh, labs and they have their own x-rays and they're really good about getting that to the state lab. Um, and they're very good about documenting it. Um, and actually um, we'll be able to provide uh, interim housing actually for any patient, veteran or non-veteran, needs to be treatment for the state of Florida. So they're really a good support network. Um, so if this person still has positive sputum cultures, um, you have a continuation phase for nine months. 
So these are just kind of, you know, general guidelines. You're obviously going to be working with your, uh, your Department of Health to uh, see the exact case. So if any questions, definitely reach out if you're interested in learning more. There is a TB uh, rotation, which I think is, is very meaningful. Um, I popped in there once or twice. It's really neat. They have on-site x-rays and very interesting cases. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions or if there's any questions in the chat. Thank you very much for your time.